second or third year iteration of dialogues and uh, our second panel today, which is the State of the Midwest Museum with Rose Bahoulier uh, from Mocha Cleveland, Trisha Paik, uh, the newest member of the Indianapolis Museum of Art, and uh, Chris Ratkins from the Minneapolis Institute of Art. Um, so this is going to be a great discussion about the amazing programming that Midwest museums are doing, and they don't get nearly as much credit as they should. So good morning, or midday, everyone. Um, so pleased to be here with my colleagues, and I was nominated to quickly introduce what the plan of the conversation today will be, um, which is each of us will give an introduction about what we've been doing at our institutions for several minutes each, and then we'll open up to conversation and take questions from all of you. So that's basically the, the plan for the morning, the talk. So. <laughs> So my name is Rose Boutillier. I'm here from MoCA Cleveland, and I want to thank Expo for hosting this dialogue. It's great that there's attention being paid to what's happening in the Midwest. I came to Cleveland about three years ago by way of Toronto and uh, have been completely blown away by what's happening in contemporary art there. I think the word renaissance is probably thrown around a little too liberally, but if it were to be used in Cleveland, now is probably the time. There's an explosion of new institutions, new curators, directors, changing pace, and just really a shifting landscape that's really exciting. So if you haven't come to visit, I encourage you to do so. MoCA Cleveland has an interesting history. It started in the 60s by uh, Marjorie Talalay and Nina Castelli Sandel as a storefront gallery called the New Gallery. And since then, it has grown and moved and been renamed several times, but always had a pretty stunning history of showing some of the heaviest hitters from the New York art world and bringing them to Cleveland. And in the 90s, it was situated in an old Sears department store, basically, which it occupied for about two decades until it moved to this building about two years ago in October 2012. And uh, the old location was kind of on an industrial thoroughfare. This new location is in the heart of University Circle, where stones throw from the Cleveland Museum of Art, the Case Western University, Cleveland Institute of Art, just really a cultural hub. And so much more presence and street traffic and visibility for this institution, which, as you can kind of see, has a very stunning visual presence. Um, since we've opened, you know, this move created so many new possibilities for MoCA. Um, you know, a, a whole new level of resources, visibility, um, capacity to show projects. Since we've opened in a new building, we've done commissions by international artists, the likes of Katarina Grossa, which you'll see here, the sort of painting on the atrium, uh, Enrique Oliveira, Corin Hewitt, Sarah Vanderbeek, and um, also doing really important um, solo shows. Last fall we did a Michelle Grabner exhibition. It was her first comprehensive museum survey and as you know, a Chicago artist who's increasingly important in the international art dialogue. So while we've sort of been doing this, this high-level expanded programming, one of the things that's interesting for our curatorial team to consider is how do we shift and reimagine our relationship to a local or regional community. I think that MOCA being a grassroots institution had a very close and familiar relationship with you know, the people that were coming to our museum were artists, they were um, people from the local universities. They really saw themselves as part of the place. Um, this new building, you know, things shift, expectations grow, and that relationship needed to grow as well. So I just wanted to talk about how that relationship um, is being reimagined by our team um, by talking about a, a, an exhibition that we did last summer, sort of reimagining what we defined as the region and how we would curate from the region, and um, using that as a sort of new model going forward. So the exhibition, which I co-curated with Megan Likens Rich, was called Realization is Better Than Anticipation. And to kind of distinguish it from other ways of curating shows, it wasn't defined by a geographical location. We didn't say we're curating just from Ohio or just from these counties, nor was it defined by a medium or really a thematic. 
we really wanted to look at a way that artists were working that was specific, we felt, to this sort of amorphous region. You know, is it the Midwest? Is it just this other place outside of the center? Most of the artists ended up coming from a sort of corridor between Detroit, Columbus, and Pittsburgh. But the show really became about a, a way of making and a spirit of making that was really tied into this idea of realization being equal parts physical, like making something, realizing it, bringing it into being, and also alchemical, so this kind of mental shift, this kind of magic that can happen in a, a transformation of material into idea. Um, so this, we also wanted to kind of create a historical context for this show and these ideas by matching artists that were either under-recognized or um, sort of unknown with artists that were emerging and sort of coming onto the national scene. So this is an artist, the, the piece I'm talking about is the rug that's on the floor. This incredible mid-century ceramicist named Leslie McVeigh. And when she began to lose her eyesight, she started doing textiles. So this piece was in this living room in an intentional modernist community founded in Cleveland in 1950. And we brought this piece to the museum. So it was the first time it had left the living room in 40 years. And it became this sort of like warm welcoming to the galleries. And then we kind of played off with um, Leza's work with its material sort of depth. You know, that rug is actually made uh, from hand-shredded, hand-dyed pieces of her husband's woolen pants over the course of four years. So it has this incredible, like, rich, warm materiality that we paired up with this painter, Scott Olson, just outside of Cleveland in Kent, Ohio, who works with rabbit glue and marble dust and locally milled wood for the frames and just very kind of rich, slow making. This is another historical figure. Um, Cleveland has a very interesting history of op art and hard edge abstraction. And there was a group there in the 60s called Anonyma who set out to really investigate perception. And um, Frank Hewitt was actually the father of Corin Hewitt, a young contemporary artist we showed in our first year. But um, he made these incredible works on mylar that were all about light and shade. And he was the last person in the group, the last man standing. And these works were, again, like in an attic in Vermont, hadn't been seen for 40 years. And yet they were this incredible sort of swan song of this movement in Cleveland. And we sort of played him off against this really young photographer, just graduated from the Cleveland Institute of Art, who was working very similarly with these issues of perception, but in studio-based photography. This is a piece by Albert Wagner, who's a prolific Cleveland artist, or was, passed away in 2006, and is mostly known for his figurative religious paintings. And it had pretty much exclusively only been shown in, in exhibitions about black art or outsider art. And so we wanted to show this other part of his practice that was really kind of tapping into this contemporary um, zeitgeist of sort of found objects and anthropomorphism and this sort of data gesture of placing the pot on the log. And this uh, very similar kind of transformation of organic material was happening with Michael E. Smith, an artist um, from Detroit, who we commissioned to make these works on our monumental stair, which is a very austere, geometric, hard edge. And he made these dried gourds as kind of ghosted arms that would float on round corners and on um, handrails. We matched a video artist up with a local furniture proprietor who does crazy DIY online commercials. That was fun. And then, so kind of talking about this historical connection and connecting MoCA to its context, this historical mansion is just across the street from the museum. And it's a pre-Civil War structure, the only one in the area. And it's basically the oldest building and the newest building facing off against each other. And so we commissioned an artist who'd spent a lot of time in Detroit, Kevin Beasley. He's now based in New York. And we commissioned him to do a site-specific sound performance installation, basically, over the course of the day in the house. 
So it's kind of opening it up for the first time in a long while. I realize I'm flying through a lot of stuff, but just to, just to kind of end things off, um, I think that you know, the show realization, and that's just a sampling of the projects and the artists that we were thinking about, was really trying to not only create something specific and sensitive to Cleveland, but something that was tapping into larger dialogues that were happening nationally and internationally. And also an important element of the show was scholarship. So we invited, um, every artist in the show had two significant texts written on them. Those were all available for free, uh, downloaded online. And it was all about kind of creating this level of discourse that was a little bit higher, a little bit more visible than it had been done at MOCA in the past. And um, this is work by an artist who's opening a show next Friday at MOCA, Kirk Mangus. And again, I think that MOCA doing his show is really a privilege and a responsibility. It's an artist who's been working in our region for over 30 years. He tragically passed away suddenly last fall. But he's has this incredible legacy, incredible influence in the ceramics world, virtually no visibility in the contemporary art world. That has to do with the fact that he's practicing in the Midwest and it also has to do with his medium. So for Moke to kind of step in and say, we want to create a history, create a context, create some visibility for this artist is important. These are some of his works. And I just wanted to kind of end by that, um, you know, this, again, this coming back to this idea of responsibility to our context and our region, this also comes with a great sense of freedom. Because working in the Midwest, you are kind of outside of these established art world hierarchies. You can go and grab pieces out of people's living rooms or, you know, like meet with artists who are 22 who have never had a museum show before. You can discover things in the most unlikely places and you can just work in a, in a way that is really inspiring and I think really has a lot of potential to, again, hopefully shape dialogues that are happening around the, the coast as well. Cool. So I'll hand it over to Christopher. Thanks, Rose. Do you have the projector? Hi, good, morning. good afternoon, everyone. And like Rose, I'd like to thank you all for being here. And I'd like to thank Expo for the invitation to be here as well, too. I've been really looking forward to sharing some of the things that we've been working on in Minneapolis um, and hopefully having a good conversation with my colleagues here. My, part, my presentation is broken up into two parts. Um, the first is to talk about the larger camp um, department at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. CAMP stands for the Center for Alternative Museum Practice. Um, if, believe it or not, before 2008, the Minneapolis Institute of Art did not have a contemporary art department. Um, so shortly thereafter, in 2010, my colleague Liz Armstrong uh, was hired in 2008, and then we developed this program called CAMP. And within it um, is a lot of specific innovations that we're working on. But prominent, the most prominent of those are attracting new donors and younger visitors, uh, cultivating contemporary art collectors, uh, new partnerships both inside and outside the MIA, um, new vitality and interest to the museum spaces and collections, and new museum practices, and this is what I'm going to focus on today, um, that both within and beyond the MIA, and then signaling to our audiences who are very general and who have not had a lot of um, exposure to contemporary art at the MIA, um, that the MIA is changing to be more relevant to a local and global community. So I'm just going to go through a couple of these projects that we've worked on really quickly and just save a couple questions for afterwards. I'd love to talk about them a little bit more. The second part of my presentation is to talk about my role as the coordinator of the Minnesota Artist Exhibition Program. Been around since 1976, and this is how the museum shows its commitment to the artists living and working in the state. It's been around for a good long time, and we've got some really great shows to, to share with you as well, too. Um, most recently, we worked with Anne Hamilton on a commission at the MIA. She was invited to um, work on a project related to our collection that would engage new communities um, as well, too. In this case, she reached out to our docents, who in many ways know the collection better than anyone in the museum. And some of these men and women have been at the MIA for 20, 30 years. So 
reaching out to them and hearing their stories about how they interact with the collection, how they share those interactions with people was really important to her. What she did is she asked them to talk about a specific object in the collection that was of particular importance and then photographed um, them behind the scrim holding that piece. And the effect just turned out really, really beautifully. It hasn't turned into a project or an exhibition yet, but you can see more about this on our iPad um, magazine called Verso, which you can receive for free on the uh, iTunes store. Um, oh, whoops. Mark Diane was invited to come to the museum and work on a brand new uh, installation for our uh, more real exhibition in 2012, 2013. And what he did is created a, a, a um, curator's office as if it had been uncovered uh, during some construction for a 1950s curator named Barton Kessel. Um, it was a fabulous fiction. People actually believed the story about this person. More importantly, and another knockoff of this, is that it got us to think more about how can artists interact with the period rooms that we have in the museum. You know, we've got these fabulous rooms that are filled with furniture and, uh, and documents. How can someone like Mark or other artists really come in and re enliven those spaces for us and kind of show that they're not just in amber, but they're actually quite um, mobile pieces? Oh, whoops, I keep pressing the wrong button. <laughs> Should be easy enough. Uh, this is a project by a young artist named Jan Estep, who studied at the, um, or at the Art Institute of Chicago. She um, worked with myself and our Chinese curators to reinstall this uh, masterpiece from our Chinese collection. It's a bodhisattva called Guan Yin. And she installed these speakers in the galleries. Um, and on those speakers, she included loving kindness meditations um, that are very much in the spirit of, spirit of Buddhist practices, um, very much in the spirit of, of mindfulness practices, and had those installed in conjunction with this piece, which is, a, a, it's a new way for us to display the work that we have on display. B, it's a chance for our curators to think outside of their sort of historical boundaries and the work with living artists and projects. And C, it's a new way for our audiences to really experience a work that they haven't really seen in this way before. Previously, it was in a gallery filled with other objects. Here, it was really isolated and created a really unique experience. Um, Monica Haller is our most recent artist in residence. Um, she has been studying soil for the past three years. Um, for this project, we asked her to think about how this idea of soil might interact with our collection. So she spent eight months um, in Minnesota, in South Dakota, in Nebraska, and Louisiana, digging up soil. And she was creating these, uh, what are called monoliths. This is her literally like right outside the museum, uh, digging in the ground. And thinking about soil as a natural resource, thinking about the historical connotations of soil as something that people own, thinking about the personal relationships to ground that people have. In Minnesota, there's some really interesting and very troubled history about soil and ownership as it relates to native populations. Um, Monica was prompted by her father moving some soil from their family farm that they'd owned for three years uh, and saving it. And that became the idea for her to spur her on. Uh, for those of you who are museum people, yes, this is really soil in a museum. Um, we found a way to preserve it so that we could uh, maintain the, the conservation levels in the museum and bugs weren't getting into the rest of our collection. But it turned into a great project and we had um, soil scientists paired with our docents, leading tours of Monica's project to kind of make that link between the science and uh, history of soil with the work in our collection. Um, the second part of my program today is to talk about the Minnesota Artists Exhibition Program. Like I said, it's been around since 1976. Um, it was started in the spirit of a lot of the artist-run spaces that you hear about in New York and elsewhere. Um, and it was always meant to be kind of outside the market, outside the museum in terms of the curatorial selection of, of the shows, but very much within the museum at the same time. So we have elected, an elected panel who actually select the shows, and that I, once the shows are selected, work very closely with those artists on developing the exhibition. It's very unique. I don't know of any other program like it. Um, we've had 180 plus shows. We have 3,000 square feet of exhibition space. So it's a real prominent uh, gesture to the artists who are living and working in the state to become part of that larger art historical narrative in the museum. Um, just an example of some exhibitions that we've worked on. Uh, Marcus Young uh, was our first artist in residence, and by that I mean he literally lived in the museum for 10 days. Uh, he did not talk or communicate with anyone other than a smile or like a, a wave. 
Um, it's part of his larger meditative practices of um, living on site. Uh, on the one hand, on, you know, on the one hand here, you have him sitting in the gallery, and he would sit uh, and meditate and be an object on display for a part of the day. Uh, for another part of the day, he wa roamed through the museum doing what he calls uh, walking meditations. He wore this beautiful diaphanous uh, robe and would literally walk through the hallways and the galleries and just not really saying anything but letting people see him and interacting with that space. And again, getting our audiences to think about work not just in a gallery context, not just an object, but as a person, as a performance. And this required a lot of work on our part to get people comfortable with this idea. When I first talked to our security guys, no, we're not going to do this. <laughs> but then, you know, we, we learned to work with our, our, our coworkers, and this is a really facilitating process that we learned to do, and it's become really fruitful. Uh, the last part of his project was to wear a cleaning outfit, and he would literally clean the lobby for hours. So this, I, this shift from ultimate visibility and muteness to very invisibility, no one really paid attention to him when he put on his uniform and was cleaning, was just really highlighted with this project. Um, Alan Brewer um, had a fascinating idea called verbatim. Uh, well, he, he's always been interested in language and, and text and, and object making. And what he did is, leading up to his show, he asked audience members to describe their favorite pieces in the museum. Just say what you like about it, describe it as well as you can. And he took those descriptions and turned them into art objects. In this case, it's our Nick Cave sound suit. Um, the person who described it was very precise about the exact height, the number of toys, how they were attached, what the surface was over the mannequin, and really created a fascinating interpretation of, of this piece. Other ex pieces in the exhibition were very different than what they actually were. You can kind of see on the, the left photograph uh, in the far right, those squares of brown represented our Rembrandt Lucretia, if you can believe it. So. Um, and Brock Blegan was another um, young artist who, you know, is trying to think more about what collections are, He's trying to think about his own collections, museum collections. So what he did for his exhibition is he created reproductions of all of these famous pieces of conceptual and, and contemporary artwork. Um, in this case, Felix Gonzalez Torres' uh, untitled Go-Go Dancer. We had this dancer come in for five minutes every day, dance on the platform, and then quickly disappear. No one knew when it was going to happen, but just as, the, as, as it's appeared in other museum performances, we kept it the same. On the bottom is um, um, Bruce Nauman's uh, Run From Fear, Fun From Rear um, uh, neon uh, piece. And then finally, this is uh, James Holmberg, um, who's our current show. Um, he's no, most well known as a very formal painter, um, but has gone through some changes as an artist over the past few years. Uh, in this case, trying to think a little bit more about transparency, trying to think a little bit more about structure, trying to think a little bit more about the, uh, what a museum is as a place to support artwork. So when we first came to me with this idea of cutting a massive 8 by 16 foot hole in the wall, it's like it seemed to fit very much with what his work was doing. But in the spirit of what we're trying to do with the museum and to have our, our galleries become more versatile, it becomes a chance to work with all of the people in our departments and the rest of the museum on these kinds of projects, all to the benefit of, of the artist's work. And that's it. Um, hello again. So again, my name is Trisha Paik, and I will share a little bit of personal stories, too, about my professional experiences, because I think it might highlight some of the topics about the state of the Midwestern Museum and the kind of ideas of what we do in the Midwest. So I've only been now at the IMA, the Indianapolis Museum of Art, for one month. <laughs> so I have some images of past programs. Um, that I had no involvement in at all, but proud to be involved with in the future and um, under the leadership of Max, Maxwell Anderson and Lisa Fryman as the contemporary curator there. They did extraordinary things, so I'm so pleased to be able to take on um, the, the chapter that they left behind for us to continue. Um, but I also brought in images of the work that I did at the St. Louis Art Museum because I was there just for five years no, no, five years, just this past, just left in May. And there we opened in the spring of 2013 an extraordinary expansion designed by David Chipperfield. So um, how many of you have gone and seen it? 
few locals. But so I brought, thank you. So I brought some pictures because I thought you might want to see um, the extraordinary architecture that David designed for the St. Louis Art Museum. Um, but I wanted to share just a little bit about my personal experiences. And I know that Rose came from Toronto and, and Christopher was at another Minneapolis in, uh, in, institution. Um, but I was raised uh, on the West Coast, born and raised, moved to the East Coast for education, and then worked for a time at the Met and then at MoMA, and never thought I'd leave New York. And the opportunity came for me to join the St. Louis Art Museum in 2008, and I took it excitedly. It was after the downturn, but everyone was like, why are you leaving New York? <laughs> And I was very proud to take on that job. And as I continued to work at the St. Louis Art Museum, I became so proud of the city and the arts community I had joined. It's a very, very rich community there. And like I said, I'm gonna speak a little more about that experience because I'm still learning the IMA and the Indianapolis Museum of Art, but I think it's very pertinent. And many different institutions there, um, the Pulitzer Foundation for the Arts, uh, the Kemper University, Kemper Museum at uh, Washington University, La Myra Sculpture Park, which is represented here at Expo, um, the Expo Fair, um, a smaller contemporary space called White Flag, and I'm forgetting some, CAM, of course, but it's a very rich community, and as I got to be more involved in that space, I realized what great possibilities there can be in the Midwest, and I think that's what Rose is talking about with freedom. And, um, and then I, when I would travel back to Chicago or LA or New York or Basel, whatever, I found that over time I became more of an ambassador, not just for the St. Louis Art Museum, but for the, Saint, for, but for the city of St. Louis. Oh, you must come and visit, and then for the Midwest. And this is from like an East Coaster and West Coaster, and so I kind of drank the Kool-Aid and fell in love with the Midwest. So I was very happy when this job opportunity came because I, was, I, I might not ever be ready to return to either coast. I love love, love, love being in the Midwest. So that's my little just kind of segue into what I want to just briefly talk about today. But I think this East Coast, West Coast idea still kind of permeates and I think inflects the way we kind of view, view ourselves. So where did my clicker go? Okay. So here is the entry to or the vista onto the IMA. And the top is just some from several years ago. And then here you can see the, the windows activated um, by a wonderful Spencer Finch installation that was uh, done um, a couple of years ago. Here we have, of course, the home of Robert Indiana, once Robert Clark, who is from Indiana and renamed himself as Robert Indiana, his extraordinary love piece. Uh, Roy Lichtenstein's Five Brushstrokes, which was just uh, inaugurated at the museum at the end of August, so I was very proud to enter this particular space. And um, uh, his widow, uh, Dorothy Lichtenstein, and the foundation director, Jack Howard, came for the celebrations, and Dorothy Lichtenstein was elated. And when you can please um, a significant artist's widow, as such as she is, we were so thrilled that she was so happy that we were able to make this. I didn't have any role. I wrote the label. Uh, <laughs> but um, it was designed in the mid-80s. It never got constructed, and so they constructed this um, in 2012. And so this is the only, there's only one other edition, um, and that's currently in storage, and maybe you'll find a home somewhere else. And here is this wonderful program that began several years ago in the entrance pavilion. A local family noted, and with the director at the time and the curators, that this entryway was very important to the experience as you walked in. And just for the design of the, of the expansion of the museum, you didn't get to art right away. So they decided, let's, let's have the, artist, the, the public confront art the minute you walk in. And so this has become a very exciting space of entryway. And one of the spaces that I... Um, will in the future be able to curate um, in the coming years. And some other projects that um, were done before, Allison Schatz. And then um, another program, um, and it's interesting, the IMA, nor does the St. Louis Art, St. Louis Art Museum have programs for local and, and regional artists, and I think that's always a question 
how to how to promote that properly. And um, so this is another space, um, the McCormick Forefront Gallery spaces that um, will have temporary monographic shows as well as group shows. And this was one of the most recent one featuring Julian Schwartz. And this is one from a couple years ago. And this is featuring um, Brian, Brian McCutcheon, who is an artist based in Indianapolis. And he's also um, a very successful art fabricator in, as well in town. And then I'm not sure if you're all familiar with the wonderful 100 Acres Park that was an initiative that um, had intended to be, was always on the, in the books uh, under the directorship of Brett Waller prior to Maxwell Anderson. And then with, with great funding and, and diligence and dedication under Maxwell Anderson and Lisa Fryman, they were able to make this happen. So, and this is an extraordinary um, endeavor because it, the concept was for a lot of the projects to be temporary. So large scale, scale temporary commissions, and there'll be some that I think um, we will see whether we, we, some permanent acquisitions perhaps and some temporary, and we'll see how, they, how that goes. And everyone asks, what are you gonna do? And I'm, I still don't know, so don't ask me. I'm still trying to figure that out with, with um, our new great director, Charles Venable. So this is the next chapter. Um, but, oh, can I go back? Can I go back? Just press the red. Oh, oh, thank you. But I just wanted to quickly highlight about the IMA because, again, what, what is offered to a Midwestern institution is land. Um, you know, MoMA is trying to find all its, and they are successfully, but you just kind of build up. You can't really spread. Um, and uh, same here in Chicago and in San Francisco and in LA. But I can tell you that the Indianapolis Museum of Art boasts 152 acres. Well, you probably figure that out because of the 100 acres part. But I brought a list because, a laundry list, because I don't know it all yet in my head of the facilities and the variety of um, aspects and um, structures there are on the property of the Indianapolis Museum of Art. So. We have the indoor museum. I don't yet have the, mem I don't have memorized our square footage yet, so don't ask me. Then we have the 100 Acres Park, which is officially called the Virginia B. Fairbank Art and, Art, Art and Nature Park. We have two historical houses for the public to visit. You may be familiar with the Miller House, designed by Eric Saarinen, Alexander Girard, and Dan Kiley in Columbus, Indiana. That is actually the same team that worked together to create the Arch, of course, in St. Louis. So that's a really wonderful kind of connection to St. Louis. It will always be connected to St. Louis. Um, the home where Eli Lilly uh, once lived, which is another place for the public to visit. There's also a third home called Westerly, which is where the director at any where the director lives, um, just very close by to the museum. There is a, a great garden adjacent to the historical to the historical house with labels identifying all the plant life. So we have a horticulturalist on staff. There's also a greenhouse where the public can buy plants and have a good time. There's a bee colony, which I heard that you do too, but we have a bee colony. Um, we haven't yet sold enough. We don't, have, we don't sell it yet. I was told that we give, we've given them to the board, gifts of honey to the board, um, which is always good. Sweeten them up, right? Uh, we have an amphitheater with 700, with 700 capacity. We have two indoor auditoriums of varying sizes, one for 550 people and 140. We have a campus architect on hand, a trained architect, because we need one to be able to oversee all these spaces. We have a conservation scientist, which is pretty extraordinary. Not all museums have that. Um, we have the IMA lab, which um, was begun, um, I guess, about several years ago and has done projects for, I think, nationally and international for museums. Um, website creation and, and technology and galleries, whatnot. Uh, we even have a working farm, which I heard is a dairy farm, an apple orchard, a community garden, and then our pavilion f to welcome the staff. So I just wanted to share that with you because that could not exist in LA or in New York or even in, in Chicago. And I think that's what's so distinctive. I know that you have a lot of land too in Minneapolis and I haven't yet visited Mocha Cleveland, but even the, you know, with the Cleveland Museum of Art too has, has more land. I think that really 
I think also the notion of the land um, really provides a kind of psychological freedom too. And I think that's really important. It's about how shape, how architecture and nature kind of shapes the way we think. And I think the freedom that we feel there is partially because we have, you know, so much, so much space. So those are the main concepts that I wanted um, to bring about. But let me quickly, can I show you images of the St. Louis Art Museum? Okay. So this is um, the facade of the Cass Gilbert and then the David Chipperfield, of course, on the left. Here is the, um, the much-loved art historical dollhouse that I got to work with and working with other colleagues, Simon Kelly, on the project. And um, 12,000 square feet in the contemporary space. And many of these works I hadn't seen, except for this, of course. I hadn't... Um, Scene. They were all in storage, so trying to figure out where you're going to place everything. So I had a lot of stress for a couple of years' time. Um, and then a great, extraordinary post-war German collection that's housed at the St. Louis Art Museum. And so the opportunity to work on that. And then we, uh, in connection with the um, expansion, we did a great commission with Andy Goldsworthy, who did a kind of regional, kind of Midwestern exploration of... Um, of celebrating the limestone, you know, you know, um, support of um, of the earth in the Midwest and in St. Louis proper, and it's called Stone Sea. Um, and you can see the before and after, where we had to cut into the land, um, and you can see the windows on the bottom um, and the the mullion, the green mullion windows. And so, it was a way f to try and show that. Um, with the Midwest resting on bedrock of limestone formed millennia ago when we were once a sea, bringing back the sea to, to the St. Louis Art Museum. Um, and um, one last comment I wanted to make, which I thought would kind of open up to the 15, 20 minutes we have left, um, or 10 minutes maybe, or not even. Um, it's this notion again about where we are geographically in the country because having come in New York, from New York and thinking about being in the Midwest when I was at the St. Louis Art Museum, and we talk about it now at the IMA, we have the language of local identity, regional identity, national identity, and international identity. And these kinds of how we, how we serve our local communities and our region, we've talked about this before, but also wanting to get national and international you know, attention um, which, of course, the IMA succeeded in the past several years. But this is language and semantics that, in my experience, is not used in New York proper. You don't need to reach to your... What is the local community in New York? What is the, what is the, the regional and whatnot? The national and the international come to your, foot, for, to your footsteps. They don't have to work. They just come. But we, right, the three of us... We're like, we have to build it so they will come, and we're still not sure what we have to build yet. I mean, guys, we're, we're working on building what it is, and I think we're still trying to find how to get people in. But I think it's just really interesting that we don't use those terms. You know, if you're even in Chicago, I don't think you have to use, maybe they do a little bit of local and regional, but I just wanted to th throw that out there because as people, maybe you're some of your museums. We always think about our audiences, and a lot of the national, international museums don't really have to think about that because they just have them built in, and we don't have that. We're like, come and visit us. <laughs> so I'm going to open it back up to you guys or Christopher. Are there any questions? No questions. In terms of shows that you accept at your museums, do you have to do things differently because you have a Midwest audience as you think about what you accept and what you turn down? Mm -hmm. Are there sort of sensitivities around that? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you got the yoga show. Cl Cleveland has the yoga, um, the museum. At the Cleveland Museum. Yeah, right, right. right. Yeah. So, no, which show? I'm sorry? Oh, it's yoga. It was at it's the, at the Cleveland Museum? Oh, it was in okay. San yeah, Francisco. So, you know, it went to the coast and then it ended yeah. up there. So. Well, the challenge for the MIA is that we haven't had a contemporary art department for very long. You know, it's sort of in the, in the 
a stack of encyclopedic books. We, we're missing X, Y, and Z, you know. Um, but, you know, Minneapolis also has the Walker Art Center, you know, which has a very great reputation for showing some fantastic new work by some fantastic artists who have gone on to be very successful. The MIA's challenge is that because we haven't had that contemporary art department, is that we've had a very general audience who don't really know that much about contemporary art. So our job is to help make that work more approachable, to help um, narrate it a little bit, to make it part of the larger narrative of art history, and to sort of show how our collections build on previous collections. So a lot of the strategies that we have at the MIA is to um, have work um, installed within the museum proper. So um, we started a program recently called Art Remix, where we would take pieces uh, of particular prominence and install them uh, in new galleries. We had a 15-foot-long Kehinde Wiley painting that we installed in our Baroque galleries. We had a Doho Su piece that we acquired recently that we've reinstalled with a, with a Henry Moore sculpture, so, a soldier sculpture. So we're trying to get our audiences to think about contemporary art, not as just this thing that is of the moment now, but is actually based on a lot of the principles that they've seen already in the collection. So it's, um, it's part of what we do generally, but it's a new challenge for us that is it's going, it's going well so far. Yeah, I would sort of second many of those thoughts because, you know, um, Cleveland audiences are unique and have not had necessarily a strong history of widely attended contemporary art. There's always been the sort of seed of a very strong contemporary uh, dialogue in Cleveland, but, you know, like 60,000 people, many of which have never come to a contemporary art museum the first time, you want to sort of be sensitive to that in terms of what you're choosing and programming, because you don't want something that's going to be um, totally without context, that's not going to be able to be interpreted in a meaningful way. That said, I think there's also things that we can do for our audiences that might get lost on other audiences. So it is, a, it is a, there is a, a unique audience responsive approach to programming. I mean, I think it's also driven by, um, it is driven by the audience, but it's also, there's, in my experience, at least at the St. Louis Art Museum, there was an attempt to create, to bring a show that, that we knew would bring in lots of people, a po popular show that would be a name brand, recogni you know, a recognizable subject matter. And then that would allow you to have some more esoteric shows on the side. So there was like, so you would plan years in advance to make sure you have a balance of programming over, over a period of time. And um, like I said, I'm gonna be learning what it's like in Indy, but um, the St. Louis community is um, pretty savvy, there, but, but there is a rich community already in place, and there are the universe, a number of universities in town, so you have built in audiences of the art students to come but then there is still the mass general stereotypical um, audience that is not so knowledgeable about art and will still come in and see a Jackson Pollock and question what it's about. And I think you still have that in cities in New York, but you have it to a much lesser degree. So I did have in some, in some ways the audience in mind, but I never felt like I wanted to dumb anything down per se, but is just giving them an entree and, and making them feel comfortable. And I had the freedom to be, at least at the St. Louis Art Museum, a little bit more conservative and traditional because I, there were so many other um, more avant-garde contemporary spaces in St. Louis that could push the envelope. And then also, there were so many families that would come because the St. Louis Art Museum is an encyclopedic museum. So there was always a responsibility that I felt about not shocking parents and their children. Um, and I think at, at the IMA, I'll take a stand on that, but I think I'll also be a little bit more daring because there's, there's a smaller, um, institution called IMOCA, Indianapolis Museum of Contemporary Art, and they're, they're, they're a great institution, but they definitely don't have 152 acres of land to show art, and so they're really wonderful, and I'm sure hopefully we'll do collaborations together, but they, but they can push the boundary, but, I, so, but because even though there's that one space, I'm probably going to push a little bit further 
in in what I in what I choose to do, but you have to kind of figure out the comfort level. There was another question there. I saw your hand raised. I'm a little tired. I just came from Paris last night, but uh, I'm an artist in Chicago. But you're from Minneapolis. You're from um, Minneapolis. Yep. I saw what you were talking about, where you take a piece of artwork that's in your museum and try to put it in a new way with other um, uh, pieces of work. Uh, there's a place called the uh, Musée de Décoratif that's on the other side of the Louvre. And they're doing, they have a show on right now of uh, contemporary furniture makers that take each, each uh, there's a room for each of the furniture makers, all their furniture, and they have to relate it. They pick a piece of artwork that's, in, uh, that's at the Musée de Décoratif. It, it has textiles and comics, and I mean, they have all kinds of things there. And then they relate some idea around that piece of work. So you'll, you could see something that was uh, like from the 17th century with all their extremely contemporary work. So I just thought while I can still think of it, I would tell you. Thanks for that. Yeah, we, we found it to be a really effective way for people to, you know, who have been coming to the museum for many, many years. They have their favorites. They come to the museum once every month. They know where our veiled lady is. They know where the Van Gogh is. But having these what we call remixes, gets them to see some of the pieces that are some of our classics, some of the pieces that they love and they're just really attached to, but also see them with other objects from our collection that, that's growing. You know, it's a living, breathing collection that's always getting bigger. Um, so dusting it off every once in a while and adding some things to it is really, has been really effective for us. Can we have the mic back here? There's a question here. Hi. Um, I, I just wanted to say, when I heard that this was going to be a discussion of the Midwest, um, that it seems to me there are two things that are really a great opportunity um, to promote and to um, give ourselves a little confidence. Um, and that's the Internet's changing the art world incredibly quickly. Um, and so the space between New York and the Midwest is diminished. And try as they might, one of my favorite institutions, the Whitney, and it's, it's uh, biennial, um, that is to be inclusive of all of American art, just has never pulled it off. And we get the, the flyover obligatory um, entries into the biennial. But last week in Bentonville, Arkansas, the Crystal Bridges opened the state of the art and bless their hearts, it took them one year and 10,000 studio visits to choose two artists from each state. And it was a remarkable opening that happened last week. Mm -hmm. And I think in that there's a lesson for all of us that our art world is getting less provincial. And uh, it, when I talk about New York as being just as provincial as any other venue in the world, um, things are going to start changing. And my understanding is when they open the new building at the Whitney, they have made a concerted effort to be more inclusive, which I thought was really a remarkable thing. But I think the internet is changing things. I think. I think that people becoming aware of the incredible old cities of the Midwest, and there, even my city of Detroit, that has such a strong attachment to the DIA, um, that is under all of the terrible things that have happened to Detroit, are, is one of the things that we hold to as giving us hope. And the great institutions that you are working at and you have come from um, give us hope too, so thank you. Any other questions or comments? Oh, there's one over there. Question there. And also what I've noticed, people are moving to the Midwest 
I mean, not just for the job, I mean, not for like in the arts, but there's a lot of just moving because they can't be creative producers in New York anymore. I know of a number of writers who've moved to the Midwest and designers and editors, and, and if they had a link to the Midwest because they once lived there or an aunt lived there, and people are moving because you can't be a pro cultural producer and, and write and, and, you know, make art anymore. It's, you know, they're being pushed out. So there's also financial necessity that I think, you know, they, Soho happened and Chelsea happened and Queens are developing and Brooklyn. It's going to keep on spreading. I mean, it went up to the upstate New York and the Hudson area, you know, for artists. And it's going to maybe spread out mm -hmm. <laughs> to the yeah. Midwest. Don't you? Right, and Detroit, I'm hopeful. Um, just a really quick question specifically about the Anne Hamilton project. Mm -hmm. um, it did look like they were actually photographing objects, not uh, uh, painted three-dimensional three pieces. Was that part of the project brief. Can you repeat your question again? About the Anne Hamilton project? Mm -hmm. Was it just objects? Yeah, those, those were objects that um, she asked for people to fill out a form um, in advance of her visit um, to the docents, to staff members, to volunteers, to, to, to choose a specific object from the museum's collection, like something from storage or that's on display. And then what you saw in the photograph is a picture of the person and then a picture of that person actually holding that piece. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's about making connections to the objects. It's about showing the connections that those um, people have by spending so much time with them. And for some of them, returning them to the use of being used. Um, some of those things were used on a daily basis. They were always to be held and to hold, to be put in your hands. They weren't meant to be necessarily in a, in a museum. So. Yeah. classic question for a curator. Um, I think, you know, it's always a little bit of a je ne sais quoi. It's like a, a quality that um, you can really tell that an artist is thinking about something in a way that you haven't yet or using material in a way that is surprising or just compelling. I think it comes right down to that. Um, something that makes you think and something that you know, engages your mind and your heart and your eyes in a way that is, I think, yeah, it comes down to just being compelling. And I don't think that's um, easy to define by like media or biography or anything like that. It's really just comes down to the individual and the piece. Yeah, I, I totally second <laughs> what Rose said. And I think it's also something for me that's memorable because if I go to you know, a biennial or I go to these fairs, I then sit back and I think after I've seen so much, what has been memorable? And that's usually, that helps me kind of decipher if it's something I want to explore. The other conflict that I always experience when looking at new art is when I see something and then I don't like it and I just like, I don't like it, I don't like it. And then I go back and I think, should I like it? Because I think about everyone hating Picasso's Demoiselle d'Avignon and everyone hating the portrait, the Matisse portrait with the green nose, I'm forgetting the title, or even people not liking Jasper Johns or whatever. So there's still, I have my own kind of inner battle that I experience that, so sometimes I might like something right away and that's great. And then, then I do the reverse of that and be like, maybe I shouldn't like it right away so quickly. Because I think sometimes really great art does take time to digest. So it's constantly an inner battle. Um, but based on your question, I think if you're in your practice, you want to make, you want to make quality pieces. You want to... And that's hard to identify too what quality quality is, but it's it's a couple of answers that I would offer. Um, on the one hand, like the first half of my presentation, those were all artists in residence that we invited based on a grant that we received. And so we had very specific guidelines about what we wanted to accomplish with this grant by inviting an artist to creatively interpret our collection. So that narrowed the field very, very 
very, very quickly um, to artists who kind of demonstrated an ability to kind of to work with collections, to work with taxonomies, to work with catalogs. So, and then it becomes a question of someone that we've worked with or someone we know that we can work with or, you know, then it became a question of, of personality. But with MAEP, um, I'm in a unique position um, in good and for, for worse and that we have this seven member panel who actually select the shows that, um, that we display. And that's always been a principle of the program. It's always been sort of the democratic driver of, of how the program works. So um, I represent the conscience of the organization and I try to think about the long view of the program and think about diversity of both the artists as well as the, of what they're showing. Um, so I work with the artists once they've been selected on really kind of shaping the show and turning it into the best show it can be. So it's a, it's a multi, multiple answer, I guess. So. Yeah. Do you have a question there, or is, are you just thinking? <laughs> oh, question. Okay. So it's been since the 80s that we lived in Chicago, but I think talking of the regional and the local versus international, I always got the distinct feeling that the, no names to be said, the institutions in town were, would not show local work because they would, it would be regarded as too provincial. We were setting our sights on being international. Mm -hmm. So how do, you, how do you deal with trying to foster the local but not being, saying, oh, well, we're just being provincial? Well, you definitely are doing it outright. I mean, yeah. that's, you know, but I think yours is a different situation too, but it, um, at the St. Louis Art Museum, there was definitely a recognition that we wanted to give some platform to local artists. I unfortunately didn't have that chance because when I wanted to, because we actually limited our programming during the expansion. So there was a few programs where I, there are a few that I won't mention, but there are a few artists that I really wanted to show in the so-called Currents program there. And I just didn't have a platform, and the only current show that I could give the, an artist show to was part of a wonderful fellowship program with Wash U, where it had to be an artist coming in through an application process, who would then teach at Washington University and then show at the museum. So there were a few that I really wanted to show, but I just couldn't. And um, I'm starting to know that there's a rich community uh, in Indianapolis, and there's a, and I failed to mention earlier, there's a great new curator named Scott Stulin, who's a new, new curator called Curator of Audience Engagement and Performance. And he came from the Walker Arts Center and is a colleague, Christopher's. And he was brought in specifically to really focus on this need to bring in audiences and how to engage them in, in a new era of the 21st century of young kids. And I do this too, but even younger kids doing this. How do you get to the museum? It's really, 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 it's hard. So he is so creative and he's coming up with great programs that's using the facilities throughout the building and outside in the Hundred Acres Park. And he's really reaching out to local artists and writers and different people to come in. And so he's really have, he has a great ability to do that. And I hope too, that in time, I'll be able to also work with other artists locally and, and regionally. But again, it goes back to that je ne sais quoi question. They have to make the art that we want to show, and, and hopefully there will be artists that I will want to show, and I don't know if Rose has a few. Yeah, I think uh, you know, provincialism is not necessarily who you're showing, but how you're showing them and how you're thinking about them and writing about them. So I think um, there's you know, what's the point of showing the international art world in a city without any specificity? I'll get back to that point. And unless you can provide some kind of context or relation to your immediate surroundings, it's just, it could happen anywhere. And I think that that is a real, um, something to be scared of, is a kind of like the international uniformity of the art world, that you can go to see these artists anywhere in the world. And I think that, you know, MoCA has really shifted how they show local artists. We don't do, um, like, small gallery solo shows anymore with little leaflets because 
that has very little visibility outside of Cleveland. We decided to change that to do conceptual thematic shows that have international connections that we have international writers think about and write about or we do you know significant projects that have deep scholarship and again with the idea that they will have international resonance and significance so i think it comes down really to the way that local artists are shown and thought about maybe we should conclude yeah we're getting signed yeah. No, I we're not getting the sign to end, oh. but we maybe we need to. Any other last questions or thoughts? Thanks so much for coming. Thank you.